So, Ned Norman, it's yours. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, I, I actually wish I were there listening to Kevin Warwick. Uh, you know, that he's a very uh, interesting speaker, so you are still in time. <laughs> no, uh, thank you, thank you really very much. Uh, uh, I appreciate uh, that you are here. Uh, for the next uh, 30 minutes, we will be talking about uh, what is this upcoming uh, meme, upcoming idea of the Internet of Things, more specifically in a specific uh, way that we interpret it at my company, uh, which is the, the spine the spimity, the uh, universe of smart sensor networks and all. No life form can afford to overprotect or over -depend, defend itself. The energy necessary to do so could come from nowhere but from some other function of the life form itself. And no life form has excess energy, excess capabilities. It only has what it is uh, necessary for its own survival and, and its own uh, uh, promotion in the uh, environment or the nation that it occupies. Uh, together uh, with these design issues, of course, the uh, world with spines is going also to uh, meet other challenges. Um, I call one of these challenges that of the signal-to-signal uh, -signal ratio, where you have no unnecessary data. Every piece of data that you have is signal. However, the sheer quantity of this data is such that it is impossible to take advantage of it uh, in a traditional fashion. Uh, and already a challenge like this is being uh, encountered by the uh, designers of the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. Probably all of you have heard of this new laboratory of uh, physics, uh, which maybe uh, you, you, you don't know, is generating with its experiments a quantity of data that it is impossible even to store uh, to say nothing about the need of analyzing the data after it has been stored. So, very uh, courageously, what the physicists have decided is actually to throw away 99% of the data, uh, but to build filters and analyzers that try and discern what is the most precious among uh, the traces that the data brings them. So this type of thinking must go also in the data networks that we are, we are building for tomorrow if we want to take advantage of them. And of course, the design problem of the objects themselves or the design problem of the relationship between the objects and their communications are just a couple of examples of the challenges that we are going to face uh, as we try to understand why is it important that we actually build and deploy these uh, SPIME networks, these smart sensor networks in, in the environment. When we think about uh, uh, the Earth, uh, there is a traditional way of actually defining nature against uh, human technological uh, civilization, uh, where the human uh, part is seen in, in opposition to the natural part. And the natural part is seen as something uh, uh, perfect, something that uh, uh, is, is desirable to go back to, something that is ideally uh, uh, achievable if we only tried hard enough. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this is a, a completely false uh, perception. Um, there, there are uh, a lot of humans. And uh, in the past uh, 10,000 years, as more and more humans uh, started to occupy the uh, surface uh, of, of the planet, something remarkable happened. Uh, only 10,000 years ago, on the uh, left side of this chart, you see the situation where 99% of the biomass 
uh, of the terrestrial vertebrates. So we are not talking about the oceans, and we are not talking about uh, insects and, and things like that. Uh, we are talking about terrestrial vertebrates. 99% was wild things. And 1% was humans plus our pets and livestock. So cows, dogs, uh, chickens, and things like that. 10,000 years later, today, we have a totally opposite scenario. The total biomass of terrestrial vertebrates is 98% humans and our pets and livestock. Humans, dogs, cats, chickens, cows, and a few other species occupy 98% of the available uh, biomass uh, on Earth. And only 2% is made up by wild uh, animals. Now, this situation is obviously radically different than what we had before in only an eye blink in biological terms. And as we are rushing towards the future, as we are uh, aiming to build desirable futures for our children, and as we understand that the opportunity for life to be lived uh, in, in, in happiness or striving for happiness in other continents should be also uh, achieved, as 1.3 billion Chinese and 1 billion Indians start to say, well, the Western world had its fun, now it's our turn. It is very, very evident to more and more people that it cannot be done in the manner that has been done up to now. Our cities are a great example of new environments that are not going to go away. It is not going to be possible for uh, these three, four, five billion people who are starting to become uh, wealthy enough to think about more than barely surviving to live the traditional suburban uh, dream uh, of America in the 50s. It is not going to be their future. On the other hand, they are already starting to be up to the task of designing environments that lead to a radically new understanding of what is going on day by day, minute by minute, in, er, around them at a level of resolution, at a level of fine granularity that is totally unprecedented. And this is achieved through the uh, smart sensor networks that are being deployed in, in the environment more and more. So we are talking about much more than RFID. We are talking about much more than being able and, and uh, shake hands with somebody uh, exchanging information or entering into a clothing store that recognizes us uh, because of what uh, uh, we have bought uh, previously. Uh, the stakes, in my opinion, that uh, we are meeting are really rather higher. And it is our belief that the Internet of Things and the spy networks uh, with them are going to be part of the solution for uh, a world that is going to be uh, sustainable, that is going to be friendly in an environment that will share uh, with everybody else on, on the planet. Thank you very much.